Thank you, Lois. Thank you, Daniel and NWDC for inviting me to do this and for recording it and having it available to anyone uh, free and open to the public. I think that's a very wonderful thing for NWDC to do. And thank you all for taking some time out of your Sunday and coming to join in my little talk here to tell you what I've spent my life doing. This piece that you see in front of you is my most recent major piece. And so I thought what I'd do is to go back and show you how I got here. I, as Daniel said, I fell in love with metals when I was 16. And so did my undergraduate work at Cranbrook Academy of Art near Detroit. In those days, I'm a product of the 60s. And the 60s, we were learning technique. We don't have the history, the fine tradition of goldsmithing that some of the European countries have. So what I was, what we were all doing then is just trying to learn how to do this. And we were fascinated by the process and most people's thesis projects were technical in those days. Cranbrook was a hollowware school. And so I learned how to do hollowware. I did a lot of hollowware. If we wanted to do any jewelry, we had to do it on our own uh, in the evenings, on the weekends. I was also doing a lot of drawing. And so I was trying to get linear drawings into my jewelry somehow. Um, hollowware just really wasn't my thing. I was sort of a hippie and I didn't want to wear white gloves to have tea parties or coffee parties. So I, I sort of was interested in jewelry. When I got to uh, uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale for my graduate work right after, Brent Kington was the professor there. He was doing small jewelry, but also transitioning to blacksmithing. We had to take some uh, uh, elective subjects and I chose fibers. I had taken printmaking and ceramics. And I thought it was time to take the third of the big three crafts and fibers. And after the teacher had us string up the loom and do some chest color strips and, and learning different ways of manipulating the shuttles and all, she had assigned us an off loom project to finish out the year with. And I chose, went to the Encyclopedia of Needlework and chose an obscure knotting technique called macrame. And in my defense, I will say it was 1966 and macrame had not quite gotten the variety that it got later. But I was uh, doing my macrame little stitches out of the book with thread, and it was almost the end of the quarter, and I needed a project for metals, I needed a project for fibers, and I thought, huh, maybe if I tie my macrame knots in wire and make a piece of jewelry, I can get credit for both classes in one piece. So that's what I tried, and it worked. Uh, Brent Kington took a look at it and he said, you know, I think you have something here. I think this fits what you've been looking for. And I certainly can't help you, but you ought to push it. And I don't want to see a lot of little squirrely wire examples at the end of the quarter. I want to see finished projects. So why don't you do two pair of earrings a week? So from November of 66 until when I graduated the next August, I did two pair of earrings a week. And I learned an awful lot by doing that. Uh, I started out, of course, with macrame. And what I really loved was the row of half-inch knots uh, up on edge with the light shining from them. But when I tried to carry some of the wires unknotted through space, they were all crumpled because they'd been used to tie knots over and over with. So I pretty soon, after two pair, uh, I decided macrame and wire just didn't go together. How can I get what I like? without macrame. So I thought, well, why not just wrap a wire around a bunch of uh, wires, bringing one out every so often, sling it through space. It's never been bent and crumpled. I can get the precision that I wanted. I had the ends to deal with, but hitting them with the torch to make a nice little shiny ball was great. I was using fine silver, so my ball went uh, perfectly untarnished and smooth. I didn't have to polish it. I didn't have to have any tarnish to, to deal with because it was fine silver. So it was zip done. Boy, did I like that. I love those little balls, full granulation. I could, you know, just little balls all over the place in it with so sparkly. 
And so I decided that the rest of the week was going to be wire as well. So I started doing neck pieces. Each tentacle is made from as many wires as there are little balls there, bringing one out every, say, six times around with the wrapper. And then the other end of them is just what ties it onto the structure of the neck piece. So I'm still doing two pair every Monday. At one point, I said, why do I bring the wire out, cutting it short, melting it into ball? I can take it out, put it back in again, leaving a little loop. Really liked that. And twisting them up, overlapping the loops, I thought that had a lot of possibilities. It was really a rich, complicated surface. Next week, well, let's see, if I bring three wires along, I can come out with three different size loops. So that was pretty part of my vocabulary over the years and use, using it in different design permutations. So when I taught myself how to draw, I was drawing things. I'm trying to make them look realistic. So I thought I should be doing that with the wire when I'm trying to learn how to work wires. So I chose insects. They're sort of delicate, linear. They translate well. So for a while, I did a series of insects. They're about insect size, two inches. So no soldering. Everything's just wrapped together with the ends of the wire hit with a torch to make the little balls. Well, the insects sort of became lizards. and um, I, I tend to go overboard on things and did a lot of lizards for a while there. And the lizard then sort of became a dragon. Now, I had married a Chinese man, and so he was born in the year of the dragon, and I made him a dragon. The maroon wire there is a lacquer-coated copper that they use to wind the electromagnets and motors, so they call it magnet wire. My brother's an electronics engineer, and he put me wise to that material. And it comes in all, the, all different colors, which is great. You can't solder with it because it's a plastic lacquer on the surface. But then I wasn't doing much soldering anyway. I was tying everything together. So it worked fine for me. A few years after we got married, we got our degrees, we went to Taiwan. He had a visiting professorship there. And I was just in love with such different landscape, such different architecture. And the culture, I was learning the language, learning a musical instrument, learning cooking. And just, it was, it was magical. Unfortunately, he passed away after the, we were there one year. And after another year, my father came over and the two of us, went back to the U.S. by continuing around the world, going west. We took three months and visited 15 countries. And all along the way there, I was looking for historical precedent of wire work. Sword handles are great. Make a wonderful torque necklace. General's epaulets. I learned how to do this kind of little twist. This manuscript bag is all metal wire coils, which are stitched down with, with needle and thread to a textile, but they're playing with light off the surface of the coil, like I enjoy off the surface of my work. So back to Monday mornings, I have been weaving as well, making little basket forms. And that allowed me to make my critters hollow so I could go larger not use as much material. The turtle shell there is just a real thin sheet that's been a repassade hammered. But the turtle's extremities, each one is a separate basket. They're wired together in under the tummy. Tummy's put on and the whole thing is put together. No solder in the whole piece. I just run these five warp strips through holes, melt them back, in holes in the shell, melt them back, and that holds it together. also allowed me to do larger neck pieces uh, without the weight of the solid silver. So weaving baskets, but weaving flat, plaited work. 
took that idea into a major neck piece, goes up and over the shoulders. And each element is three strand braided first, then woven, uh, silver, gold, and some magnet wire. I was teaching myself how to draft patterns on graph paper, like real weavers. And instead of going over and under, over and under every warp thread, the warp being the long ones that go, in this case, up over the shoulders, and the weft being the ones, the silver ones that go back and forth, you float over three and under one, three and under one, or two and two, or four and whatever. So that gives you the pattern there. Learning how to make complex basket forms. Uh, I did this in Taiwan. I didn't have my material with me. And um, so I tried to design something that would take a lot of time. And the horse tusk were bought in the local market. And the uh, um, we had banyan tree in the yard. So that was all those things hanging down. And lots of little lizards on the, on the walls. Lizards eat. Mosquitoes. So the Chinese term for the lizard is wall tiger. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's a little hanging bird's nest like form. But all tabby woven, which is one element going over one, under one, over one, under one. I had made a dragon for my husband, so I thought, hey, I can make a phoenix for myself, like the empress. And the new thing here was those large loops that form the wing feathers. And it's one wire that is just looped through the loop in the row previous and squash flat, sort of elongated chain link fence, you might say. But otherwise, it's all my regular looped vocabulary. When I came back to the U.S. on that large trip and all the trips since, I, I collect a lot of jewelry, uh, local, ethnographic, uh, traditional folk. And when I can afford it, I do. And especially if the piece is broken, it's a little cheaper, but also you learn from it. So I thought these were strips of loop and loop chain, like the Greek work. But when I looked really carefully, I saw that it was a tube that was just flattened and traced a wire around, and I found that it was knitted. So I thought, well, oh. You can knit wire. I'm going to try that. So I've made my own flattened knitted tube and then made a, uh, a drawing, you might say, a wire drawing of a phoenix and just uh, sort of stitched it in the, in the form. I loved that wing kind of chain link fence, so made just a necklace of wings. And these are pretty long. That, that goes almost down to the waist. Mm -hmm. Very flexible. Well, after I got back to the U.S. in 73, I came back. In about 75, I started the first working in series. Instead of each piece, a completely new challenge. I was able to work a little more quickly if you, you know, use some of the things you already know and just add some design differences. So these are all coil basketry in radial symmetry, in, in bilateral symmetry. And the way it's done, I bend all of the heavy wires first to form and wrap first one. Then when I'm wrapping the second one and I get to a predetermined point, I figure eight around. Wrap the third one and you come and figure eight around the second one, etc. And that's what holds it all together. I was living at home in Cleveland near Cleveland, in the home I had grown up with, with my dad, for a while. And I wanted to explore baskets, so I went up in the attic and got my Easter basket, looked very closely at it, and tried to figure out how it was made and how I could translate how it was made into my wire. Most baskets are made with a lot of short elements. Each element has two ends. I don't like ends. So... I was trying to do it with fewer, longer elements, which was the main translation. Went down the basement, got my mom's laundry basket, did the same thing, trying to figure out how I could translate how it was made into my, my techniques. And I had a Northwest Coast 
Indian basket. When I looked closely at it to analyze the structure, it didn't really look woven quite. It didn't quite look like there was one element going over one, under one. It was two elements as wefts, the ones that go around and around. And they, it goes over and then it goes under that one and it comes back up to the top, alternating with this one. So it's, it's those two elements are twisting. And I had to do a little research and I found out that's called twining fell in love with that. And I really wanted to try to do a little more of that. I did a little snake basket um, with a little uh, knitted snake, but the twining there, I used a single element and it really, you don't see that it's twined. It looks almost like it's regular tabby weaving. So I wanted to try to explore that further and did a larger piece about seven inches high six and a half inches in diameter, I think, where I used two elements running parallel to each other to make a little bit broader element that would then also make more space in between the rows, which really then highlighted that little slant, that little slant that a twist gives. This is what I loved about twining was that little off perpendicular. So when you do a big piece, you got to figure out how many warps and how long they're going to be. So 85, three feet long, that's six feet dia diameter of stuff that can get tangled. So it takes patience. But as you see, I have two elements there, two, two wefts. And the two wefts, each one is made up of two wires. So it gives that broader than it is high element. Did the middle column while well, I could still get to it. Came down around the outside. I like radial symmetry, but I throw myself curveball by giving myself odd numbers to deal with. And uh, so there are five elements that come up as sheets and go turn into tubes. Then they split and resplit like trees or tops of stained glass windows or something like that. And you see I have lots of warps, <laughs> wefts rather, all there, the little hanks. But finish it off. Now, it's made out of basketry, but it's not a basket. It's a form. It's small, so I didn't really call it sculpture. I call them forms. And since it doesn't have to hold anything, I wanted it when it was turned over to be another interesting form. So that's what it is upside down. You look at that end, you see that sort of a kaleidoscopic thing. And then you look at the other end and you see that. So now I was into these larger, more complex forms. Necklaces became things to test out and give me ideas to, to pull into the bigger forms. This necklace is a coil basketry to hold it together along where the gold is. And then lots of wires come out and sort of wave back and forth, sort of reminding me of my mother's hair. Uh, she had Her hair was down to her waist and she kept it in a little bonnet, nape of her neck. And, and so when she would comb it out, it would have these kind of waves. So that gave me the idea for this piece. This is six inches high and 18 inches in diameter. And I think this one is the most successful of my reversible pieces because when you turn it upside down, you get that one. So I said the magnet wire comes in a lot of different colors and I had been collecting it. So I started to make a series of pieces using a lot of the colors, mostly just blending them. Where I needed white, I used silver. Where I needed yellow, I used gold because I couldn't find any yellow magnet wire. So, well, gold was the right color. So I'm not, I'm using it for its color, not its value. And everyone said, oh, you're base metal with precious metal. I said, well, it's orange and yellow and white. 
So a number of salmon kind of colors, reds and maroons, greens. In the late 70s, there were a lot of blockbuster exhibitions that went around the country. Scythian gold, Irish gold, Thracian gold. I was playing with patterning on the surface. It's all twined, but if you float over, say, five and under one, over five, under one, and it'll give you a, a pattern like this. Playing with slit tapestry, gold and silver. Well, I moved out to Seattle in 1980, and by 1983, I had... Uh, found a house that I wanted to buy, and then I started remodeling it. And when I really moved in and had it first remodel, remodels never done. I gave myself the best room in the house for my studio, the one for southwest facing window, lots of sun, direct sunlight on my work is the easiest way I can work. I can see the most. So it's that room with the window open. I don't use a lot of equipment, nice rolling mill, a place to solder, a bench to, uh, to sit up, well, a table to sit at is all I need. I use a, I have a nice anvil and I use it once in a while to stamp my name on a piece, but that's about it. And a part of my chain mail collection there on the wall. But I can look out, look up from my close work and look out a long distance over Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains. So in the early 80s, mid 80s, I wanted to do bracelets. I hadn't done bracelets before. So I took an idea from one of my favorite chokers and pulled that idea into a bracelet. Bracelets were great. They were shorter. You could do them faster. They're only a third as big as a torque. And uh, I wanted to do tubular bracelets as well. So when I wove one, I found or twined it. I found that I couldn't bend it fast enough to get around my neck, my wrist as I had my neck because it would sort of collapse like soda straws do. So I had to cut it into pieces, in this case three, sort of file it down so it's almost like a triangle. And then I had to solder them back together. Well, the joint wasn't very pretty because they didn't quite fit. So the solution was to put a big fat sheet piece in between so you couldn't tell they didn't fit. So I call those my cheat sheets. Really liked that idea. So did quite a few with the little elbows or the cheat sheets in the corners. I would sit out on the deck, do my weaving. I call it weaving, do the twining. Everything since 74 has been twined, not woven. Really looking at patterning. Then when I had a bunch of them made and it started raining here, I went back in, started cutting them up and making bracelets. Now, all these uh, sheet pieces in the, in the corners are hammered sheet. I don't cast anything. I had said yes to doing a solo show. So I needed a lot of work and I only had so many bracelets and necklaces. And I thought, ha, huh, I haven't done earrings for a while. So let's do some more pairs of earrings. And when I was sanding these down so that I could get the frame soldered on, they got pushed together on my bench and I just fell in love with that diamond negative. I thought, wow, I could do 18 or 20 of those and solder them in a row and make a great choker with all these little, a row of these diamond negatives. But I couldn't use my cheat sheets. I'd have to weave them so that they just, the wires all matched up one by one as they pushed them together to solder them. And I thought, well, that's going to be a challenge. So that sort of got pushed back on the bench. And I did other things for about a year until the gallery I was dealing with in New York, in those days, Byzantium, got the idea of doing a major show in celebration of the Metropolitan Opera Guild's 50th Golden Jubilee at anniversary and they assigned each of the artists one of the divas and her famous role to be the inspiration. So I was given Elizabeth Rethberg and her role of Aida. Well, I looked at her jewelry 
and there was a row of diamond negatives. I thought, okay, that's that's it. I've got to got to do this piece. I took a great big deep breath and ordered ten ounces of gold, and started in making my X's, soldering them together right up through the diamond negative. So you actually start the twining here, picking up all the warps, and then your solder is the same as right down there through each one. Well, I really liked it. It's a 10 ounce piece. So it's out on your shoulders, sort of like that jewelry was on her. I didn't have any more gold. So I looked at some pieces I'd done in grad school and thought those don't need to exist anymore, melted them down. So I had enough to make a little short tube and sliced it so I could get four rings out of it, which I really liked. And then I made some bracelets with a little bit of gold in the corners. Okay, got through that year. And in the fall, that big piece sold, which gave me some cash to get some more gold. But it also told me that there might be a future in doing gold neck pieces. So I tried one again. Here's a stretch X piece. And then I tried uh, cutting up little tiny X's. And then I tried one with O's. This is my string of beads piece. The idea being, number one, the hole needed to be round. So don't sand it down too far. It won't be round anymore. And number two, I wanted them graduated like a string of pearls would be. So those were the challenges I gave me for this piece, gave myself. Well, put the X's in the O's. I wanted to do some bracelets. So uh, used that hammered sheet, cheat sheet corner piece and just took the form and made it into a lapis piece. Did sort of triple fluted element. All these are hammered, and I, my uh, hollowware experience from undergrad school really came in handy when I was doing these forms. Got that triple fluted piece onto a choker. Kept doing more rings. Got a little tiny tube onto a pair of earrings. Each earring is 15 pieces, which is hollow. The un There's only a little bit of solid, which is, you know, up through here. I've been doing flat and tubular bracelets, but the flat ones were always against the wrist. So for this idea, I wanted to put them up perpendicular to the wrist. I had some extra pieces of tubing that hadn't really gotten into rings yet. And I thought, well, why not combine them to make sort of patchwork kind of ideas, leftover, leftover pieces, leftover fabrics. Liked that so much that then I designed this necklace to have different tubes, different patterns, uh, 18 millimeter lapis beads. So these are all beads and it's strung on a chain. Okay, so the mid mid nineties, I had some books: history of jewelry, story of jewelry, jewelry through the ages. We most of us teachers have those books, and I looked at the pictures, and I might be read the captions, but I never really read them cover to cover because I'm an artist and sort of I look at pictures. I don't read that much, but I started reading them. And it was fascinating to me that the one translated from the uh, uh, Italian had all, all the all the examples were from their museums. And then the, the British one, they had all the examples were from the British Museum. And that was, that was great because you saw different pictures and same story, sort of different pictures, but not quite the same story. Because the British one said the Dark Ages, not much happened and it was only three pages for the chapter. Then I read one translated from the German and they went on and on and on about the Germanic migratory times and the jewelry was gorgeous. 
And I said, I've got to do more reading. I really want to know more about history and the history of jewelry and how everything interacts. So I started taking books, lot, armloads of books out of the library. And as a faculty member, you didn't have to take them back until the end of the, the school year. So I just kept accumulating books, reading them, more books, more books. And they were stacks in my living room in categories. And I wasn't making any jewelry. And I sort of felt a little guilty about that. But I thought, well, professors read books a lot. And then they teach courses. So maybe I should teach a course in the history of jewelry. And that would be a rationalization for reading all these books. So I started a, a history of body adornment course. And once that was up and running and going, then it was time to get back to the bench. And I had said yes to doing a major solo show, so I had to do a lot of work. And I thought, it won't be a problem. I've just looked at every gorgeous piece that people have made throughout the ages, and I'll have so much inspiration. No, that's not how it works, at least for me. So I had to go back and start with X's. And what can you do with X's? And how many time, ways can you slice an X? And I thought, you know, hmm, what I just... So I do all these rings by slicing up a tube. So why don't I make a tube the size I need for a bracelet and start slicing? And maybe I can come up with some decent pieces that have a little bit of difference. So I made the tube, took some slices off. And then the first two are bangle bracelets, which have a nice pattern, but they're bangle bracelets. So let's get some more form going there. What can I do? So I wove an intermediate size tube and slid some of the pieces in there. And that's more interesting, but still sort of its, its silhouette is just a line. But I had a little extra piece of that tube that in between size, too big for a ring, too small for a bracelet, fits as a napkin ring, but I don't need a gold napkin ring. So the myth that I sort of have built for myself, I'm not sure if it's true, it might be. I came home from school one day, totally frustrated with faculty meetings and turf wars. And, and I slid that napkin ring onto my ring mandrel about the place where my ring size is, and I just bashed it with a mallet, and it felt so good, and it looked good to me, and I said, this is interesting. Let's see if I make a tube too big for a bracelet, cut off a slice, and match it. Well, after buying the gold, weaving the gold, slicing off a slice, soldering the edges on, Weeks later, I couldn't get myself to smash it, so I carefully bent it, which was interesting, but it sort of looked like a puzzle piece. So I took another slice off and tried to get a little more adventurous, and this one is much more successful, I think, because it, it undulates through space. It's not just a silhouette. Tried smashing. And yeah, it's, it's okay, but not as adventurous as I thought I needed to do. And I was running out of tube. So the very last slice that I had, I thought I've just got to finally do it. And of course, it's the one I like best. So that one did appeal to me. So what's the next step? You weave a tube too big for a necklace. So here it is. It's a foot in diameter, almost. I've sliced it into five little slices and soldered the edges on. You can see how big it is. One of them came, got squashed down to this one, which I really liked. I thought that, that's great. Then I took the two little ones and soldered them end to end so that I had a much bigger tube and I crocheted it, which I thought turned out. Pretty interesting. So I thought, okay, what I need to do is to not weave a tube, but weave a ribbon, twine, twine a ribbon, a long strip off of which I could cut pieces. So 
I can cut a little section. I, of course, have to solder things onto the cut edges so it doesn't unravel. And once it's all soldered on, I can take and crunch it, squeeze it around, hammer it. Once I've got a form of the twined piece that I like, then I can extend the lines of the frame so that they become lyrical, they go through space, they do something nice in with the, uh, uh, the, the form, the crunched form. So these are not drawn out ahead of time. There's no pictures in my sketchbook about these because I'm just cutting out the pieces off, bending them, and then figuring out what the lines are going to do. Did a series of uh, uh, brooches along the same way. A bracelet. You can see that this this is five separate pieces, and then each one figure out what the what those lines are going to do after I sort of line them all up. Necklace, linked pieces. I got uh, early aughts. I got a commission. I don't get too many commissions. I deal through galleries. This guy tracked me down from New York and his his fourth and last child was going to get married and he wanted to do something really nice for his wife for giving him such a wonderful family and a wonderful life. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? This guy is such a nice guy. So I asked him, okay, in what sequence did your kids come? Well, you know, we were married a couple of years and we had a kid and there were a couple more years and we had a kid and a couple more years we had twins. So I designed the piece with two really heavy wires, the man and the woman and Melu of the household. Upsprings um, one of the kids goes running around. Then they have another kid. That one goes running around. Then they have two twins. And I said, now, where, where are they all living now that they're married? Thinking maybe spread out across the country. And he said, no. Uh, one's upstairs in the same building, one's around the corner, and you know. So they all come together side by side at the other end of the of the necklace or the uh, bracelet all together. And what I really like about this piece, visually it's fine, but I love the fact that when we asked her to loan it back for an exhibition a few years later, she wouldn't do it because she doesn't want to be without it. It means too much to her. And so that was so wonderful because that's one of the things I really hope my jewelry does. It, it becomes really precious to someone. So I liked visually what was happening with it and made this necklace, which is quite similar. No family story behind it, but uh, using a lot of the same ideas, larger scale. I've been doing a lot of those crunched uh, pieces of a ribbon and then bring, bringing the, uh, the lines out. And I grow a lot of flowers in my garden. And somehow when I was doing this piece, I hadn't meant it to look like a flower, but suddenly it seemed to look like a flower to me. And I thought, well, sure, I'll try to make a flower. And I sort of liked that. Tried to make a more precise flower, and I sort of like the uh, abstracted ones a little better. In 2012, the Bellevue Art Museum gave me a wonderful retrospective. They did a beautiful job of installation. I couldn't believe it. Royal purple with my yellow gold. Mm, yummy. And what was so interesting was to see pieces brought back, this, this form that had been inspired by the necklace, but the two hadn't been close to each other for decades because they were in different collections. So it was, it was a lot of fun to see that, to see all the work together. They produced a very nice book, catalog. And so it was one of those bucket list things that, uh, wow, okay, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty cool. Well, after the show came down, after I was done with it, I had spent two years on it without making any jewelry, dealing with the catalog and 
all the checklists and cleaning everything, getting everything photographed. It takes a long time. And I didn't know where to start to get back to the bench. And Ron Ho convinced me that I should enter one of the NWDC shows in the, in the fall of, of 12. And he said, it's, it's got to be in in two weeks, Mary. I went, Ugh. So I had to totally change things. So instead of one piece that went all the way around, I had to do linked pieces. And instead of an elaborate catch, I did just a hook and eye and was able to get it done in the two weeks, which amazed me. But I liked what was going on there and did another one with a hook and eye catch that's down here in the front. Then I thought about the flowers again and came up with this little lily idea and decided to run with that for a while, making linked pieces so that they're flexible neck pieces with uh, taking, taking artist license with the form of the lilies, having a little bouquet. Taking them and and I love the Celtic compass work for patterning and the Japanese family crests, things that are designed within a circle, and of course my radial symmetry. So I did a brooch with three repeated designs here. Really liked it, so I decided to pull that into a series, and that was a lot of fun series of brooches, all with the, the triple symmetry. And the lilies are there. They're not always recognized as flowers by people. Just permutations. Of, it was a fun design game to play. But 10 was enough, and I I thought, now where am I going to go? I had been invited to participate in an exhibition that was talking about what had happened for the last year. COVID, what else had happened? Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too move. an awful lot was happening in, in uh, 2000. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to get my work, which is not normally narrative, into speaking about political happenings and things. And so I was procrastinating, all fall went by. But when I woke up on January 7th of 2021 and thought about what had gone on the day before, and I thought, here, our democracy was something that we've worked at and we've built, and it took a long time. And to see that it's so fragile that it might have been, in effect, burned down in one day. So I thought, okay, my work takes a long time. It's maybe fragile. And if I subject it to a challenge, a, a danger, to see if I can pull it off. So I thought, instead of melting back those little balls of one, just one wire sticking way out away from the others where I know I'm only going to hit the one wire. Why don't I just really take a torch to it and see if I can melt it to make it okay, but not too much to ruin it. And so that was the idea behind this piece and then the, the, the neck piece that I made that I showed at the beginning. So now we've come full circle. So this is this is where I'm at, and right now I'm trying to do a series of small lapel pins and rings to try to see if I can take this melted organic edge that I really do like and is much different than my hard edge wire that I used to solder on these and see where I can go with that. So thank you very much, and I'll be open to questions.